Welcome to Dublin. This is Paul Gillen with theCUBE at the Software AG International User Group here in Dublin, Ireland. Kicking off today, it's the calm before the storm. You can see it's quiet in the background. That won't be the case for long. A lot of people are going to be flooding in here for uh, two days of, of packed sessions. And um, this company is close to my heart because I covered Software AG as a, as a cub reporter 40 years ago, and this company is still around, it's still relevant, and it's still drawing a lot of people to its uh, international user group. Chief Product Officer, Officer Dr. Stefan Sig is here to talk about strategy, talk about what he sees out in the enterprise. Thanks so much for joining us on theCUBE. Thank you for having me, thank you. You joined uh, Software AG from SAP, you were at mm -hmm. SAP for a long time, yes. and you came over here. Uh, what enticed you? Well, look, I mean, uh, it's been a great time at SAP. I had great topics where I worked on data warehousing, databases, analytics. But then, you know, you know, sometimes you're ready for a change and you get an offer where you have a much more self-contained responsibility where, you know, what you can do and what, what is then driven to, to the customers is you can influence much more than within a bigger company. So that was my motivation just to to have more handle on what actually gets uh, gets out there to, to define much more directly what the innovation looks like. Uh, you, now, you know, in the software industry, having been around a long time is both a blessing and a curse. <laughs> uh, what do you want to maintain of Software AG's legacy, if you will, and I know you probably don't like that word, but no. what, what do you want to maintain and what needs to be recast? What needs to be made more new? So I, I think it's, uh, when, when you talk about legacy, I talk about timeless software. Yeah, one of my bosses uh, coined the term, and I picked it up, so it's, if, if software is around that long time, actually it, it becomes timeless, and it doesn't matter anymore how long the software is around, and you can take, for example, my favorite example is Microsoft Excel, is around for almost 40 years, I would guess. Nobody's calling Excel uh, legacy, and nobody calls uh, RS legacy, and uh, Adabas and Natural, for example, is just there around to keep all those super critical, super mission critical custom applications that were built on top of this technology running and running and running because they carry the company, they carry the, the ongoing operations of, of, of entire huge companies, and that is what we are doing. We kind of continue to innovate we, we look at what's going on out there in the market, companies competing to, to, against each other, not anymore only over their industry kind of uh, um, usual capabilities, but also competing, uh, competing with software. Yeah. So more and more, you know, software plays a bigger role in all those businesses and all those companies, and a new breed of competition comes from below, consisting of some software guys just learning enough of an industry to compete. Interesting what you were saying about Excel. I don't think we think of Excel as, yes, it has been around since the 80s, and yeah. so has Oracle, and yes. so has OS 360, yeah. and DB2, and, and uh, Linux, and many yeah. of these core uh, software components that make up yeah. global digital infrastructure. Yeah. They're not new, they're no. tried and tested. And what is the advantage, how do you mind that advantage in building out some of the new areas of <coughs> Software AG's business? Well, of course, we, we keep the good things, we keep you know the, the reason why those pieces of software are around so much, and that's so important. And then we adopt uh, what, is, what is there uh, um, as, as new cap uh, capabilities and opportunities. Take AI, I will be talking about AI a lot, uh, not just for the sake of AI, but for example, how AI can make the use of ARIS much more productive and much more efficient to have uh, to come to the case where process insights, you know, you don't have to dig into the data and you look at the screen so much, but the AI is telling you what's going wrong. So we have, we, we, we mine the data, we reconstruct the business processes, we, we have the KPIs attached to the processes to each and every variant, each and every instance, and AI is making the summary without you know, a human being needed to spend hours and hours to analyze each and every process instance. We'll dig into that a little bit more in a moment, but I want to yeah. go back to one, what you said about software, yeah. and how software competency is now becoming almost the defining yeah. factor in, in yeah. uh, uh, competition. Yes. What do you hear from your customers about that? What do they, well, do, what do they worry yes, about? They need support. So they need you know, software experts like us helping them to build up the expertise there where it matters. So you know, 
I see oftentimes that companies jump onto the software topic or software challenge and they start to invest people, resources and money into commodity, into stuff that is already existing for a long time instead of thinking what is actually the differentiating part, what is the last mile of my road towards becoming a software company too. And there's a lot that you know, Software AG we can provide to those customers in order to jumpstart this process, in order to avoid that they waste the money and time on things that is all existing, yeah? like integration, like uh, process management, like IoT. This is all there in the foundation. The interesting part for a given company is what is my interpretation of that? What is specific to my company, to my business, that there I'm investing my people and my money and my time. And, you know, we are helping them to do that very quickly because, you know, we provide the foundation and the technology <coughs> underneath. So what do you tell their customers? I'm sure many of them are facing this conundrum of, uh, they don't feel they can differentiate anymore. Uh, the business is too competitive. There are too few areas to really differentiate the company. W what do you tell them? You know, we, we tell, think about, you know, where is, what, put yourself into the shoes of a bunch of software guys learning their industry. What, what is it that they can be fast in that you probably maybe are not so fast in, in terms of, using technology and software and then you know invest into that because it is clear that the uh, if you compare a bunch of software guys and uh, an industry incumbent the advantage of industry understanding on the side of the industry incumbent is much much higher of course trivially so but then you know how fast can i grow my software expertise to to have again a balance of that and, and that is what, what we are talking about uh, with our customers. We are talking about connectivity of their products. You know, how can I you know, make sure that the products that I deliver to my customer get connected and get, are not disconnected to me as a vendor? How can, help, how can I help my customers as a producer of products you know, making um, the operations of those products more efficient, more effective, uh, like the example of, of predictive maintenance is all around, but it's still exactly that. Yeah? So maintaining, monitoring, connected sets of products out there is, uh, is something that is um, a game changer, a truly game changer. And we are doing this, and, and of course we, we also have discussion with customers, for example, in retail. Somebody came to me and said, well, you know, there is no point that I, as a retailer, compete against my competitors over the price of a, lit of a bottle of milk. I mean, today I'm cheaper, tomorrow they are cheaper, is not really a thing, even though pricing is interesting to optimize on. But on a larger scale, to, com to be more competitive for that very retailer was to their business processes, having a better handle on their business process, having a better understanding what is crucial about their most important business processes, having cru the core people understanding it, document that, roll it out, maybe to the store level of a, of a retail company, optimize it, you know, design the KPIs along the lines of those processes, finding out early on where are deviations to my optimal process. Is my optimal process actually really optimal? Does it need to be adopted because the data speaks a different language? This kind of strategic view on my core business processes and an analytical view on the data coming together. And that is what we now call process intelligence. And this is, in my point of view, in, in many discussions that I'm having with customers, an absolute a focal point on today's and tomorrow's competitiveness. So how are we to think of Software AG in this process, uh, are in this equation? Are you a process company? Are you a digital transformation company? Can you, so, can you summarize all the pieces yeah. that you put together? So, uh, look, I wouldn't, I'm hesitant to put it all under one umbrella because this umbrella necessarily will be very general, like transformation, like digital platform. These are all very broad terms which you know, can be 
even a term coming from one of the big, big, big software vendors. So I would rather say, you know, we have a portfolio that is, you know, consisting out of main brands like Aris, like Alphabet for um, strategic portfolio management, like Cumulosity for IoT, and like Arabas and Natural for, you know, application foundation. So we're talking about these offerings, these brands which are operating in quite different markets, in quite different environments of competition, and, and that's what we, what we are. We're not artificially, you know, making a big story around it. It's, it's, it's becoming quickly too, um, too abstract, too much abstract, and uh, we want to be talking concretely what, what we do. Business process optimization, IT landscape optimization, helping customers to adopt the IoT uh, promise, you know, making um, a software-driven business out of their products, and of course continuing with their uh, custom applications that run on Arabas and Natural. This is what we do. You authored an interesting post on the Software AG blog recently. You referred to a, uh, a survey you had done that found that I think it was 85% uh, of IT mm -hmm. executives said their technology stack is more complex today than it was two years ago. Mm -hmm. How are you thinking about this problem? How are you thinking about how you can help them out of this increasing complexity? Well, um, one of the drivers of complexity is um, suboptimal integration. So if you have, you know, five different integration vendors, uh, three different API management vendors, and 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 uh, and, and uh, seven different data management and 84 uh, software and so that's, security that's vendors. That's not that's yeah. not that's not working. Yeah. So and every day there is a new thing coming in in the cloud. Now the cloud is, on the one hand side, uh, promising um, everything is is made easier, but actually, at least in an intermediate time, it's it's making things much more complex because. No company on this planet is making a hundred percent shift from one day to the other from on-premise uh, um, um, uh, um, on on-premise infrastructure, on -premise, uh, infrastructure, infrastructure to the yeah, cloud. Uh, mm -hmm. data centers, on-premise mm -hmm. data centers to the cloud. This is always a a, uh, a journey, and in most of the cases I know, there is around about fifteen to twenty percent that will stay in the data center because it is not ready for the cloud, and it is not necessary to bring it ne uh, ready for the cloud. Uh, there is, you call it ne uh, legacy, you can also call it mission critical applications that still perfectly run on, of course, a much, much smaller, but still on-premise data center. So 20% stay. Then let's say 40% go into the cloud, but not into the public SaaS cloud, but into a private cloud, so into cloud environments that are owned by the customer at AWS, Azure, or Google, or whoever, but it is not um, a, a service, a software as a service. It is uh, cloud deployable applications that I, as a company, deploy into my cloud because this is what the new software looks like. It's not installable anymore. You have to deploy it into a Kubernetes cluster, things like that. And then number three is the true SaaS service that is running somewhere, I don't care how, where, and I just consume that SaaS service like CRM, and it's not even in my cloud. So three different, and then maybe I could have edge cases where I have uh, infrastructure and software running in a, a factory shop floor. So these are four different things that I have to integrate. That is um, building complexity. Um, complexity that you, at least for the next period of time, cannot avoid, but you can manage. It's a question of managing that complexity with state-of-the-art um, integration software, with state-of-the-art IoT software, with state-of-the-art process management software and IT um, portfolio management software. And that is where, where you are. Yeah. You mentioned AI earlier. Yeah. You've been through a lot of trends of, of uh, bubbles. Mm -hmm. um, is every, it's been all about AI for the last year. Mm -hmm. Is this a game changer or is this a, a phase, a craze that mm -hmm. will uh, melt into something else? Over the long term, what has really changed about AI? So, 
I've been around for a long time and uh, I was also a lot into what was then called data mining, which everything of that, right. like cluster management, like uh, correlation management and all that is now called AI. Um, but actually what is, what is really new, this is those uh, large language models. Those are actually also not so new because they have been around for quite a long time just for language uh, matters like translation. Yeah? So that was already a big revolution when, when, because in the early days, you know, the computer linguists, they tried to teach a piece of software how language works and they built translation engines for that. And then this one guy came and said, well, there are millions and millions and millions and billions of web pages out there that got translated. Why do I just not search for a translation? And I just don't do it in a dumb way. I do it in a, in a very intelligent way. I, I have tokens. I have small pieces that I get translated somewhere. Then I piece it together again based on, on, on statistics. And what comes out magically is a better translation that is spit out by a system that has been trained to understand the language. This new language model translators, they don't understand language, of course. They're just looking, searching for translations, and they're puzzling it together based on, on probability theory. And that the result is so good is kind of a magic thing. Now, fast forward now, the large language models can, can, can get uh, answers to questions um, much more broadly than just translating a, a, a string of, of words. Yeah? You can ask anything, almost anything. You can ask things where there is enough evidence that there is sufficiently good coverage out there, wherever it is. And what comes back is, again, stunningly, stunningly good quality. Of course, if you ask a question that nobody knows, of course, then also a large language mm -hmm. model mm -hmm. doesn't know it. Yeah, I, I mean, but it will give you an answer regardless. Yeah, probably right. wrong. Probably, probably wrong. wrong. I mean, it's not. It's it's really not difficult to make the la language models hallucinate. Yeah, mm -hmm. you just ask something that really nobody knows, yeah, like a math question or something like that. Yeah, and I I had one time that. It was after some, you know, back and forth uh, conversation with um, whatever model. It would insist that hundred is a prime number. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, you yes. got to say that. Yes. And you're a mathematician, yes. so yes, it would it would insist hundred is a prime number. Well, okay, but if you if but but if you ask uh, these models to generate code, fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I'm showing today, we now ask the system to generate processes. So we can ask, so please, I'm sitting now in, in front of an empty canvas, but I, have to, I want to document my core business processes. And to get a jump start, I'm just asking, can you please give me, let, can you please generate for me your best practice business process for procure to pay in the retail industry in Europe? And that's and a magically known, it comes. Pop, that's pop, pop, a known pop, process. In, BPM and, in the BPM notation, it is populating the canvas, and it's giving you a start for a process model that would take you maybe 10 hours to build manually, case, uh, I mean box by box, right? It's amazing. Well, we could go on and on. Yeah. As, uh, we do have to wrap up, but a, a quick preview. You're kick kicking off the conference in, in a few hours. Yes. What will be your topic? So I will be talking about you know, the differentiating, differentiating folk uh, potential of software in general, of business process management in particular, of intelligent IT portfolio management in, in particular, about IoT and about integration. And I will be showing uh, in a live demo <laughs> how AI can help to um, make business process optimization more efficient and more effective uh, for, for a given company. Good luck with the live demo. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Stefan Sig, so thank you so much for, for joining us here on theCUBE today. Wonderful. Looking to be a great conference, we're looking forward to it. Thank you, thank you for having me, goodbye.
This is Paul Gillen. This has been The Cube. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're headed into the home stretch here at the Software AG International User Groups Conference in Dublin. I'm Paul Gillen on theCUBE, and with me is Kostin Deal, the head of IT strategy at Hitachi Rail, who gave uh, a presentation yesterday about how they are going at Hitachi Rail, how they're going through a, a fairly big strategic um, shift right now. And uh, Kostin, first of all, thank you so much for be being with us today. Thank you for having me. It's a big pleasure. Thank you. Uh, Hitachi Rail, I have to admit, I hadn't heard of the company. Hitachi, of course, very diverse company. Yeah. Uh, but what does Hitachi Rail do specifically? Well, Hitachi Rail is a uh, train manufacturer. It's one of the, the global, global leading train manufacturers. Uh, we provide, um, you know, uh, the train. We provide uh, the signaling and uh, signaling services on the uh, tracks. And then we also provide service and maintenance uh, to our customers, you know, on the on the uh, trains that we manufacture. Must be a fascinating place to walk around. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> so you are, um, you spoke yesterday about a, a um, an initiative you have there called One Hitachi, where you're taking these various business groups within Hitachi Rail and uniting them. It's a big deal. It's a big project. Yes. What is One Hitachi, and, and what are some of the complexities involved? Uh, One Hitachi is the um, you know, a vision for us to, uh, you know, com combine multiple business units um, to work, you know, um, strategically under, you know, one process, under, you know, limited IT systems, you know, throughout the business. And it's, it's really just to uh, further standardize uh, and become more competitive, you know, uh, as a customer base. Uh, how many business units are involved currently? Uh, currently, we have about four four different business units. And do you have different ERP systems, different manufacturing systems? Yes, yes, we have um, you know several different ERP systems, uh, manufacturing systems. Um, I would say you know over the past you know three or four years, we have you know um, conducted uh, projects and programs to uh, you know integrate you know these systems, um, but it's, it's still ongoing. So talk about the outcome. What are you trying to achieve ultimately with this combination? I would say the outcome is uh, just to, to, to continue to be a, um, a competitive force within our market, uh, being able to provide a seamless experience to our customers. Um, and I think that's really what the, the main ob objective outcome, you know, just based on the information I see from our, our CEO, our CIO, is to provide our customers that you know, streamless, um, you know, experience, customer experience. Now, as head of IT strategy, I mean, this is a big goal, and there's a lot of complexity involved in it. Where do you start in trying to decompose this into the the different project elements that have to be managed? I say I'd start with the the capabilities of Hitachi Rail. Uh, what we what we have done is really truly identify you know, what Hitachi Rail uh, is composed of and what, you know, what it's not just about what we provide to our customers. It, it mostly talks about uh, who we are as a company. You know, uh, we are procurement, we are uh, design and development, we are payroll, we are, you know, multiple different things. Uh, and then, you know, what processes and organizations and uh, systems uh, make, you know, they'll make up those capabilities. Now you have different systems already in place invariably some are going to win and some are going to lose mm -hmm. some will be chosen to to mm -hmm. be the standard how do you manage making those decisions well those those decisions are you know we have Hitachira has you know several lovely uh, solution architects you know people that have you know uh, that you know, that really good technical expertise to understand you know what what systems or what tools are going to give us that competitive edge. So we lean on our technical team for that, you know. Um, we have an understanding of, you know, the direction that we go in from a strategic perspective, uh, but we also take that strategic perspective and give this to our, you know, our proper, our proper technical people in-house who are able to communicate, you know, through technology, you know, the uh, objective that we need to reach. And part of this is about process. It's about understanding process, mm -hmm. how things work now, how they sh will work mm -hmm. eventually. Uh, you're a veteran user of Aris, mm -hmm. I understand. Um, how does process mining enter into the equation? 
to be honest, um, we haven't gotten uh, that far deep in that process mining space. Uh, I would love to, you know, sit here and tell you that we have, but, you know, we have to be, you know, um, you know, as a employee of Hitachi, we have to be a bit ethical and, you know, just say uh, we haven't gone to that level of death in our in our processes. Well, well, maybe talk more generally about process mining because of your your experience. Um, yeah. What what are what are the important factors in understanding how processes work? Mm -hmm. How do you get at how do you get at how that process is really working and how, where the exceptions are? I would say uh, the transparency. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, right. being able to sit with process experts that are that are truly into that day to day, um, you know, understanding of you know what makes their their specific processes and then being able to create diagrams and you know create the story you know through pictures of what what it is they're actually doing um identifying the um the correct objects um you know articulating you know the process through objects so for example you know task objects um application objects information objects so really being able to create a complete picture of that process that's what that that's what helps us enable us to truly know uh, what's going on and, and be have insights you know into our process and what what's the importance of understanding process owners the the people who are really key to making that process work um, because I, well, I would say the, the key to it is having someone with the the proper experience to speak for it you know um, there are times when um, we we have you know personnel or people that aren't necessarily at the right skill set or or sometimes they're a little bit too high in the business and sometimes they're a bit lower in the business but so finding that you know um that expertise that proper expertise you know really you know um provides a script for our, for our air systems now we've gone from uh you said you have about 16 years of experience with yes. air we've gone from a, a, a process mining being a very interview intensive, manual, mm -hmm. people intensive. Now much of it is automated and early, the first day of this conference, mm -hmm. they showed some Gen AI capabilities mm -hmm. that are being added. Um, how how does this strike you? I mean, how, how does this excite you? Oh yeah, the... oh yeah, it's, it's very exciting. It's, um, you know, what, because what happens is, um, sometimes when you sit down with a process expert, um, it, it takes, uh, uh, and then you're, and you're coming from with a, a blank page, you know, it, that takes a lot of time to shape their mindset because they don't necessarily look at things from a diagram perspective. So you have to shape their mindset, get them really understood on, you know, what it is we're trying to do, uh, where um, AI could provide that, you know, that foundation of information, you know, and then we can give that to a process expert. And then at, this, at that point, they're really, you know, kind of just, um, reviewing and, and, and providing, you know, checking of if, if what uh, the AI has said as correct, you know, so it's it's kind of like just providing that foundation. You know, we still need the expertise, you know, from, you know, our, our human race, but, um, you know, that AI can, it can definitely provide a foundation. Now, you're head of a, a IT strategy. Mm -hmm. That's a job I think a lot of people would, would have, that would appeal to a lot of people. What, what does your job entail? Well, this is a new role. Um, so currently, my job entails, uh, as as today, uh, as I know today, it involves um, you know working with our uh, IT leadership team uh, to really understand um, what it is, uh, what their objectives and their goals are, uh, and being able to um, create uh, palatable um, you know content, whether that be through IT projects whether that be through um, capability analysis and assessment uh, to, um, I guess I would say, fulfill the goal of, you know, what, uh, you know, the IT leadership team uh, wants to do. Mm -hmm. So it's it's just, it's taking their high level strategy and identifying um, the correct projects, identifying the correct capabilities, uh, you know, working with the technology teams and, and identifying the correct solutions and um, you know, just executing on that, and knowing what's strategic. Yes, exactly. What's the time frame for one Hitachi? Uh, I w I would love to tell you. <laughs> you know, um, you know, I would say to be continued. You know, um, Hitachi is a fascinating company, um, and we are constantly evolving. And um, you know, we are there. There is a, a lot of elements that are now one Hitachi. You know, we are still. Well, like I, I think I told you earlier, 
we're about, you know, three, three, almost three to four years into this, you know, but it's, you know, it's a continuous thing and it's a, uh, it's part of our values now it's really part of our mission as well to be uh, continuously strategic as you know, working as one Hitachi. And, and the chain always changing. Mm -hmm. uh, congratulations on your new role. Thank you. Thank you. Best of luck with the project. I Cost, appreciate that. Cost and deal. Head of IT strategy at Hitachi Rail. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. That'll do it from the Software AG IUG conference. I'm Paul Gillen for theCUBE. Thanks for watching. Thank you very much. Welcome back, this is theCUBE. We're at the Software AG International User Group Conference in Dublin, Ireland. I'm Paul Gillen, we're here on day two. There's a lot of people here, it's very exciting. We've got a half dozen different tracks going on, lots of customer presentations. And one of the areas where we're seeing a lot of those presentations is in the product called Aris. And I have with me the general manager of Aris, Mark Vieter. Mark, welcome, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Paul, for having me. For the uninitiated, <laughs> describe what Aris is. Aris is the uh, business transformation suite, really helping customers to transform their organization and the way people work, to um, optimize um, their processes, uh, to differentiate in the markets, and also to stay in control um, in terms of regulations uh, and quality targets they have to um, comply to. So it's really an integrated suite where we have all the capabilities needed from um, designing the processes, measuring how the processes are executed, compare these two, um, manage the risk and compliance activities in a company, and also help them to automate uh, the processes uh, at the end and really closing that uh, loop. And we provide that in one integrated uh, suite and one product. Uh, what are some of the forces that bring customers to you in the first place? Is it regulation? Is it competitive change? Is it technology transformation? It, it's all of that. Um, and I think that is where um, ours is strong, that we can help customers to cover all these different use cases. So if they're trying to standardize their global way of working, um, differentiate from their competition by new customer journeys they are implementing or streamlining their internal um, processes to get rid of uh, inefficiencies. Um, it is about the compliance to regulations like Sarbanes Oxley, GDPR, uh, FDA compliance uh, in, in the pharma sector and in others. Um, and on the other side, as you mentioned, the um, IT transformations that are going on. Um, all the cloud migrations customers are doing are driving new processes. Um, or the big IT transformations in the SAP space, um, or the S4HANA migrations that are needed. And here we are leading uh, with our RS3 to help customers and all these use cases. The, are customers often surprised by how complex or convoluted their processes have become? Yeah, I think it's for, for many of them in our yeah, surprise or eye opener when they really uh, see the measured processes. So when we take the data out of their SAP system or their Salesforce or Workday and really generate automatically their as-is executed processes. And often the management says, yeah, we have, this is our standard process. We might have two or three alternatives how that could be done. But when they really see the data, it is hundreds of variants uh, really surprisingly hundreds of different routes through this process and they really don't understand what their people are really doing and why they're doing it and really surprised by the yeah, big optimization potentials or inefficiencies they are uh, facing today. And, and what, do you, what do they do to fix these problems? I imagine a lot of these problems relate to people taking matters into their own hands, people going outside the established process flow. Yeah. Do you uh, provide them with some guidance on how to fix the problem as well? Yeah, I think on the one hand side, I think think about you have monitored uh, and automatically created the as-is processes, 
and you have now these hundred ways how it could be done. We help them with our new generative AI capabilities to find automatically the anomalies in the process so that they can really concentrate on fixing them. Plus, we are also helping them to understand the automation potential um, where they can automatically create a workflow or execution uh, of these steps to automate manual steps they have today. Um, and on the other side, help them to manage the changes that are needed. So if you see there is something broken, people are doing things they should not do to communicate the new way of working to them and secure that everybody read it, understood it, and behaves um, how it should be done. Can you generalize about the kind of efficiency improvements you typically see customers achieve? Yeah, I think we really see um, massive improvements um, in, uh, in that area. So we have customers in the, uh, in the telecom uh, industry that really improve their um, customer service levels uh, by 20, 30 um, percent. We have customers when they think about the SAP HANA migration, saving uh, 10, 15 percent of their project costs uh, by doing it in a process oriented manner. And if you think about these projects that are multi millions, hundreds of millions um, worth projects, um, and on the um, other side, it's really, uh, if you think about compliance, avoiding big fines that you get um, from the auditors that you need to pay. So all our banking customers really save millions by avoiding uh, these fines they normally have to pay uh, by using us. Uh, now you take a data-centric approach to process modeling. How do you capture this data in the first place? How do you capture the processes? I think there are um, two different uh, ways of doing that. I think first is you can have uh, the extraction from your execution systems like SAP, Salesforce, and others, and automatically generate the process flow and use that as a starting point for your to be design. Um, the other way is you ask your employees how it should be done or how they're working today. And in the past, it was an, an empty piece of paper when they needed to start, say, designing their process. Uh, we are now helping them with our new Gen AI capabilities to um, get a best practice from the global knowledge about a, a good sales process in a retail company of that kind in that region so that they really can accelerate their design based on best practices powered by Gen AI. Um, or if I'm a user, I can just using Gen AI describe verbally saying, hey, my first step is this, then I do that, and then I need to decide. And so really describe it in your natural language. Um, and the RS AI companion then generates the process flows um, out of that. And then you can compare the designed way with the measured way and really put them um, as an overlay together so that you directly see um, all the uh, compliance uh, or conformance issues um, that there are process steps executed that should not be done, or there are steps yeah, missing in the execution, some 4i principles that are skipped, um, and that gives our customers the insights to improve the efficiency, but also stay uh, in a compliant way. And we also have big auditing companies, um, like the big five that are using our process mining capabilities to support their audit teams. In the past, they were, let's say, running around in a company asking people how you do it. Now they can use process mining to really see how it really was done. So the generative AI capabilities, everybody's talking about that at the at the conference uh, this week. Uh, how easy was it to adapt the off-the-shelf models to the business process use case? Yeah, I think we have um, different 
Right. Scenarios where we use Gen AI. One is what I described. If you want to create um, a process, um, we use the yeah, knowledge of the world that is available in these large language models, of which they Azure OpenAI or ChatGPT, and there is so much process knowledge in there that we can le then leverage to create um, a template process uh, for the user. Um, the other use case is that customers want to have um, a chat GPT-like questions to their own process knowledge. So think about a, a big retailer, they have documented all their processes, how the people in the store should work, and then the user in the store can just take their iPhone and ask, hey, what should I do if there's an accident? What are the three steps I need to take? And then he can give direct answers via Gen AI based on the process knowledge they have uh, standardized and provided to run in this store. Um, and the people do not need to be trained. It's a natural language question and answer way. Um, I think that really helps to, to accelerate that. And there we are using the customer specific process knowledge and put Gen AI on top of it. The first use case is more using the, the world wisdom. And the other use case is similar for process mining. We have all the, the data of the automatically created processes and the KPIs related to that. And then you can ask questions as we discussed, what are the anomalies in the process? Um, what are the advice? How can I approve that? So there we are combining the world knowledge and the um, uh, measured process and having Gen AI to support that in a very intelligent and smart way. Gen AI becomes a consultant in effect. Talk yeah. about, talk about the, the, the fit. Uh, Software AG coming out of the database application development world. How does Aris fit into the portfolio products? I think Aris is now um, yeah being the main focus of Software AG um, going forward. Um, and it's the one area where we really see a lot of uh, growth in the market um, because with all the changes out there and all the crisis, um, it's really a must have for every company to get uh, their processes uh, optimized and under control. Um, and the Adabas natural side of the house um, is really uh, an existing customer base, a stable one um, that are now going also to um, to the cloud and leveraging new capabilities there. Um, but the new customers uh, we are seeing more on the uh, on the hours and alphabet side, where we're really growing the business. Uh, yeah, in big double digit numbers um, in a very profitable way. Which is remarkable because the business is over 30 years old. This is not a new category, but clearly a growth category for you. What's ahead? How, how do you continue to evolve on top of a, an established platform? Yeah, Aris is there in the market for 32 years. Um, and the evolution is by new use cases. So I think processes are the core of every business. So you know business without a process. Um, and probably a good example for a new use case is the um, EU AI regulation that uh, just came out. And every company has to assess their AI apps they want to implement. If it's for uh, face recognition to let somebody in the uh, building, or if it's um, meeting minutes uh, with a co-pilot, or uh, um, deciding on a new employee. Um, and these AI apps needs to be assessed in terms of the risk based on a criteria catalog from the EU. Um, and the, the criteria are to be reflected where this application is used in the process. Just think about an AI app that is taking decisions. Um, if you do that for routing emails, it's probably no risk. If it's about deciding if you hire an employee or not, 
but that's a high risk uh, category. Um, and then you need to register this uh, also at the EU level. Um, so it really depends on the process where it is used, on the context. And we also help customers to do the governance around that because the AI apps will fastly evolve uh, and change what they can do. So you need to reassess that on a continuous basis. If you implement new ones, if you change existing ones, enhance capabilities. And we have the yeah, workflows uh, embedded in RS to reassess them, to trigger um, the communication with the EU. So that are new use cases where RS takes place. Um, and I think there will be for sure many more regulations coming up. Um, there's always crisis ahead, um, supply chain issues, um, okay, we had COVID, uh, the next crisis will come and I think you need to stay really resilient and I think that is one of the, the top topics right now, for example, in banking and financial services. Yeah. They talk about operational resilience yeah. because the governments are forcing them to understand how resilient are there if a new crisis is coming. Um, and they need to document that, show that, prove that. And it's the end. The question, what are my business processes? What happens if it's broken? If the IT is broken, if the facilities are on fire or flooded? Um, what are my reaction in terms of processes? Um, if a data center is going down or an ATM machine is not working. So what are the impacts? And uh, that needs to be assessed. And that's what we are providing and then servicing with ours as well. Well, if, if governance, is, if uh, regulations are a prime driver of business, I, I don't think you'll have any shortage of business coming in the uh, in the uh, approaching years. Yeah, I think that's also the, the positive side in terms of uh, new customer journeys that many of our clients are developing with ours to identify new communications and improve the customer experience to really drive the top line, um, bring new products to market, um, bring new services to the market, and the new service means new processes that you need to implement. If you change your business model, um, it will change the way the entire organization is acting. So that is a big driver uh, for our customers as well. So it's both sides of the coin. The revenue increasing cost optimization part but uh, the control part exciting times exciting opportunities and you certainly excited the audience yeah. yesterday with your demo mark thanks for joining us thank you Paul. if you get a chance to check it out on software ag's website a demo of the new aris uh, aris i should say capabilities with the generative ai features it, it is kind of a wow uh, example to look at uh, what they've done in, in, in back um, reverse engineering processes and showing how they can be approved with Gen AI, Gen AI a real breakthrough. Uh, Paul Gillen for the Cube here at the Software AG International User Group Conference. Stay with us. Welcome back, this is theCUBE, day three of the Software AG International User Groups Conference. I'm Paul Gillen. Um, it's a good thing we have unidirectional mics here because it is bedlam behind me. You can't, you can't hear it, but there are lots and lots of people here for a coffee break. A uh, very excited group at this conference. And uh, one of the exciting presentations we heard was yesterday was from Ian Batty, who's the head of the Office of Architecture at St. James Place and who agreed to join us today. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Thank you for asking me to talk with you. So uh, good, good to be here. Uh, it, I, we've attended this conference uh, for a couple of years now. And uh, as you say, th there's a buzz about the place that's, that's interesting to, to see. It really uh, is. Uh, and you were uh, talking yesterday about a topic that's a little bit unusual for a tech conference about change management, about man how, how organizational change is managed. Let's first hear a little bit about St. James Place. I'm not sure everyone is familiar with your company. Yeah, I, I, uh, yes, that, I think that, that's fair enough. Uh, I, I may know a lot about it, but it's a company that's not, not globally known. 
St. James's Place uh, is a financial services company. We provide uh, financial advice to primarily individuals um, and we then we provide that advice to them as where they need to save for their pensions and, and, and uh, other investments that they may wish to have. Um, and then we manage that money on their behalf. So they will invest in funds that Finance St. James's Place constructs and manages for you. So that uh, I, I believe the tagline is, is that invest in the future that you want to have or something like that. So it's, it's a long term financial investment plan with a number of independent businesses operating as financial advisors um, that are then used by St. James's Place to manage those investments. Um, and I work in the, the Office of Architecture, which uh, you mentioned that I, I, we work in business change. I, I work in business change. I don't work in IT, which is the first thing that people sometimes find unusual is an architect not working in IT. And I think that is one of the, the critical things that that we do slightly differently from a number of organizations is that we are very concerned with, with changing the business in the whole. It doesn't have to be upgrading servers, it doesn't have to be deploying new software, releasing functionality. It's how do we change the business as its entirety? And that, that classically covers the four dimensions of, of architecture, of technology, application, data, and people. Um, on the business side. Where we are focusing much more, where we are seeing the value that is, and this is a change in enterprise architecture generally, but our focus specifically is to, to focus much, much more into the business space. That is where the value is. That is where companies have traditionally not been able to, to communicate well why something is happening and, and it's one of the key things that we we try to do is is understand that that why and whether that's a why in terms of people being changing their roles people being reassigned project reassigned new software whatever else it will be why are we doing this that that senior executives will make strategic announcements that's what we're doing and people's lives will change as they get a new job or their, their, their role changes um, and it's 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 easy to disempower your employees in that way and to make them feel like they're, they're just part of a, a machine and, and a cog it, and it sounds counterintuitive I mean I think you would naturally as a, as a top executive want to explain why changes are being made why do you think that doesn't happen I, I think that there's a gap I, I genuinely believe, having spoken with, with a, a large number of executives over my, my, my career in, in a number of organizations, not just St. James's Place, is that because the, a, a C-suite organization, people working in, in that very top echelon, they have access to additional information, they have knowledge that they are bringing into that position, and they genuinely believe that the deliverables that they are providing to their workforce are sufficient and I think the gap that we are identifying is is in the old scientific technology what has been provided by the C-suite is necessary but not sufficient it is not providing that translation from a high level direction of where we're going what we need to do how we're going into into a traceable deliverable stream of work that oftentimes we find there's a deliverable stream of work and there's the high level objective. And that gap in the middle is where enterprise architecture is now starting to play its most important role, in my opinion. So describe how you go about that process. I mean, how do you, how do you communicate effectively and thoroughly to the people who need to, to hear the message? And how do you know when you've done it right? <laughs> I'm not going to say we have all the answers on that one. I think that's that's the first thing to say is that how do you communicate with with the uh, with the executives? We have to communicate in a way that they understand the additional value that will occur as a result of talking to somebody else. That that's the key thing is that you have people who are time short uh, and information loaded already and and. And, and explaining to them, because 
senior executives are not dumb people. They're very, very intelligent people. You know, men, women who have got to those positions through years of work and practice and they know how to make decisions. What we are looking at doing is is closing, I, I call it, the, the, it, it how, to, how to influence someone is closing the gap between information and emotion. Is that a lot of those decisions that are being taken by executives are based on a certain amount of information and then emotion beyond that. And actually there have been various studies that have been made where it doesn't matter how much more information you provide to people, they will continue to make that decision based upon an emotional basis. Um, and and that, as I say, it generally been proved with, with psychologists making medical decisions based on, on case studies, um, that that's what's going to happen. So what we have to do is work out how do we close that gap and influence people because providing more information top down or bottom up isn't going to make that difference. It's what do we need to do? How do we need to engage? How do we need to communicate to make that influence work better? To close that gap between that emotional response and the information you can provide. So it sounds like empathy has become an important absolute uh, attribute it, of, of emotional intelligence and empathy and understanding and the realization that more and more people are, are I, I believe, rightfully so, questioning their place in society, in an organization. They are questioning the value of, of the work that they are doing. They want to be part of something. Daniel Pink's idea of mastery, autonomy and purpose, that I need to know why I'm doing this. What is the purpose of doing this? For some organizations, if you're saving lives, working in the health service or, um, or providing clean water to someone's home, taking it away. It's there's obvious. A, there's, it's obvious. Yeah. When you're looking at something like a financial services company that I work in, it's a harder sell for someone to say, all I do is, write code for a spread uh, to, to make a spreadsheet or an application to do things it's easy for those employees to get disenfranchised it's easy for them to feel that they've been dictated to by senior management or technology trends are coming in and they're not being listened to or any other reason that we lose employees engagement um, well let's let's take a real world example now that I think a lot of people watching this are wrestling with, and that is AI. They're bringing AI into organizations. There's a lot of concern, uh, fear even, in the workforce about AI replacing jobs. We're telling them, no, 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 that's not going to happen. It's going to, AI will be your co-pilot, not your, not your replacement, but that fear still exists. What advice do you have for communicating to these top executives as they begin to introduce AI? AI is, is a hot topic, absolutely. We're seeing it throughout presentations here. Everyone's talking about this over the last few days, how they're going to talk about with AI. Um, AI is an interesting one because it's a little bit like, I, I'm a data architect by historical preference or, or pro profession. Big data was a technology that came in. AI is a technology that's come in. It's a new technology that in many situations is looking for a problem to solve. And because it's looking for a problem to solve, people are trying to use it in many situations, many of which are not actually going to be effective. And I think this is where people are seeing the concern, is that people are saying, we could use AI for this. And actually, as, as we, as I've been learning in the last few days, I'm, my knowledge of AI is increasing daily with, with attending these kinds of conferences. AI is not necessarily a repeatable process. If you ask the same question of the same AI engine one day after another, you will get different answers. And that's resulting in fear in people when you need a consistent answer. And if you use that AI in one of those areas where you need that consistency of answer, then people are rightly afraid that technology is being forced upon them without genuinely understanding the intricacies of the role they do, the industry they work in, and the outcomes they need to achieve. There are other situations where you're doing a repeatable process, or there is genuinely knowledge out there that you don't want to start hitting Google and trying to write the scrap, scrap the piece of paper. 
I used to work in the oil business uh, and I worked for a, a, a large oil company that had a little A5 pad of paper. I've, I've kept some of these sheets of paper, a blank sheet of paper, but down in the bottom right hand corner, it said, still the most difficult environment to work in. Mm. Now this is from an oil company that works offshore, in the Arctic, in the jungle, in frozen places. From them, the most difficult place to work in is a blank sheet of paper. How can we get AI to fill in that blank sheet of paper with something that we then use that human's knowledge to refine? And this is the path that we're on with our AI, is making sure that we are using people's knowledge, and I'm using knowledge specifically, it's stuff that the computer cannot know about, stuff that you are bringing from a related discipline or from your experience of work or your, your knowledge. How can we use that to recognize where it's wrong, where it's not coming up with innovation, where it's not coming up with um, the, the right answer to your particular problem. And I think innovation is one of those key things that, that's already been identified repeatedly with AI. AI, almost by definition, can only look back at historically what has happened. Mm -hmm. For genuinely new ideas, that requires a carbon-based computer, right. not a silicon-based computer, right. to we come up with it. We haven't figured that part out. We haven't yet. Let's bring this uh, back to technology because this is a technology yeah. conference. You were giving your talk on the Alphabet track, which is Alphabet is for IT asset management. Uh, what role does software play in the change management practices you're talking about? Okay, so so actually, so Alphabet supports two distinct areas of, of, of usage, which is the, the enterprise architecture tool and the strategic portfolio management. And I'm particularly focusing on strategic portfolio management. Um, and that means identifying where to spend your money, how much money you've got, what are the priorities you've got as a company. What we find that Alphabet brings for us is it has the ability for us to capture those high level corporate strategic goals. We can then break those down into more manageable chunks that will operate at divisional and then even team level. We identify the, the outcomes that we need to achieve for that. And we're already starting to create a large set of information. And it's critically, it's an interrelated set of information that needs to be presented ideally graphically so that people can assimilate that because there's a lot of information we're talking about. We then need to identify for those outcomes we're trying to achieve, what business capabilities, what applications, what servers, what groups of people, what information are we going to have an impact on? Oh, no. Suddenly you've gone from having you know, a vision, half a dozen corporate goals, 30 or 40 outcomes, 500 applications, making the links between those 30 or 40 outcomes, 500 applications, however many divisional units you've got in your company, however many information concepts you've got so that when you start to go into that business change process, you aren't starting from the blank sheet of paper. Okay, I've got this project that I'm going to deliver. Right, everyone, let's stand around the whiteboard. We'll brainstorm the applications that we think are going to be impacted by this. We'll, who are the people going to be impacted? The tool is providing us with a little bit like AI because I never believe any information that I've got is 100% accurate, certainly not if I recorded it yesterday. Yeah. Um, it will always change, but I'm giving you 80, 90, occasionally 99% of the starting point of what you need to know so that when you go into your business change with an allocated budget, we know how much you've needed on that because we know the scope. Right. Now, there will always be things that come up. Every project runs into challenges, however many percentage of them run over time and over budget with additional complexities. We accept that, but we know the outcomes you're trying to achieve. We know the scope of the information and the applications that you're impacting. And that gives you a much tighter defined window of error and error bars on <coughs> the length of time it'll take the amount of stuff to do because we have identified all the possible impacts for it. So that's what we're using the technology for. It's a journey to get the integration between what we do in Alphabet with all the other tools that are out there and all the other people, <coughs> me, and the cultural aspect of some people like starting with a whiteboard. <laughs> they like those ideas. 
again, this comes back to how do we make it worthwhile for people? You can't just dictate from on high or from a different group. You've got to make it easier for someone to use the information from the tool than not. That's where you deliver the value to your organization. Thought-provoking stuff. Ian Batty, a uh, very different message from what we usually hear at technology conferences, <laughs> but one that's every bit as, as relevant as, as anything we've, uh, we've heard about technology. Thank okay. you for joining us here. Thank you very much. We'll be back from Dublin at the Software AG International User Group Conference. I'm Paul Gillen. Stay with us. Welcome back, this is theCUBE, I'm Paul Gillen. We're here at the Software AG International User Group Conference in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, the calm before the storm here right now, it's quiet behind us, but in a couple of hours this place will be packed with uh, customers of Software AG uh, who are um, represent have a whole variety of technical disciplines. Uh, with us today is, uh, before we get started, is Girish Pancha, who is uh, Software AG's Chief Product Officer for the web methods and the stream sets product lines. That's right. And thanks for joining us today. My pleasure, I'm excited to be here. Now you are an entrepreneur. You started StreamSets yeah. and you sold it to Software AG. What did you think, the integration market is so crowded, there's so many different companies. What did you think you could do differently and do better? Yeah, no, look, I, I've been in the integration space for a few decades. I was the Chief Product Officer of Informatica prior to that. Uh, so your question is very relevant because when, when I started StreamSets, even my you know, former colleagues wondered, you know, what is there to do in, in data integration, let alone the broader integration space. Um, and you know, I didn't really think I was going to do stream sets when, when I when I retired from Informatica. But I came to the realization that there were a number of you know, very uh, secular trends, you know, disruptions that were happening in the data integration space. So uh, first was the rearchitecting to a cloud native, um, cloud native world. world. The second was uh, the speeding up of these um, capabilities to keep in keep in line with the business. So what we what we use what we describe as batch to streaming. And the uh, the third was the shift away from uh, let's call it transactional data, you know, managing transactional data. In the old days, when you talked about a you know customer, you'd think about how much did they spend on you. You know, so you'd go to your your application to figure out what that was. And and what was happening was that we were moving to really trying to have a more holistic view of everything, you know, customers, employees, our partners, et cetera, where there was a lot more event and what what we called interaction data that was kind of around around the edges. You know, the the term that was being used was big data in those days obviously and, and that kind of information was much less structured, you know, much more fluid, always on. So these are the kind of fundamental uh, kind of changes in the technology landscape that I figured you know, the existing incumbents would have a hard time modernizing. Not to say it can't be done, but I thought there was at least a, a, t and a kind of a time to market opportunity with, uh, with stream sets, and that's what I- A lot to unpack manage. there. I mean, in, the, in terms of integration and bringing together all this structured and unstructured data, we're seeing the, the age of the data lake now. That's right. Or the data lake house, uh, the iceberg file format, some really transformative technology. Mm -hmm. uh, how are you seeing that changing the integration challenges that your customers face? Yeah, so, and that's, that's uh, kind of front and center, you know, that's, that's our sweet spot. Um, so we, we started off dealing with, you know, dare I say, it, the legacy technology that's Hadoop, uh, and now you know most of our business is around data lakes and data lake houses and iceberg, et cetera. Um, you know, at the at the highest level, what I would say is that it it hurts or it makes it more difficult at, at design time, because historically you had much better typed information in your source systems, and now now you really don't. Uh, but I'd say equally importantly, when you talk about the runtime or the ops side of the world, the operations side of the world, because of the fluidity of those sources, things are much more prone to you know, breaking and, and whatnot. And of course, on top of that, there's this expectation what DevOps did to, to applications. There's an expectation that we have an integration working at, at the speed of business. So all in all, you need the system to be continuous 
and the system to be able to rapidly deal with kind of unstructured, semi-structured, unknown data. And so that's, that's areas of focus uh, that I had. You also mentioned streaming, and that's an interesting topic because I mean the research I've seen is only about half of enterprises are using streaming in any capacity yeah, at yeah. all. Is that because the business doesn't demand it, or are they missing out in many cases on an opportunity? I think it's the latter. Um, you know, I think I, I don't think th there's probably only maybe ten percent of all the enterprises on earth that would say we don't need to do things uh, that way. And of course, within each enterprise, we did hit uh, uh, buyers and us users that said no, we don't care. You know, um, take like uh, uh, equities, for example. You know, they, they make these bets. If, if it's not HFT, if it's not high frequency trading, they're making these decisions and holding long. So they don't need streaming every minute. They're happy to kind of look at it up periodically, whether it's daily, weekly, quarterly, you know, you know there are different, different um, things there. But I would say everywhere we look generally within financial services, healthcare, all these um, you know, verticals where we're you know, very strong in, there is a need for streaming. The, the challenge, I think, is, is kind of twofold. The existing technologies really did not handle it. Um, so you know, now you say, okay, well, do I just kind of make do and maybe try to speed that up still to give me kind of a good enough solution? Or do I really start investing in a new technology in the same space to handle my streaming problems? So the value uh, of those use cases, I think, um, you know, some in, in both with verticals and to a certain extent within the verticals, you know, different different um, companies, enterprises have different kind of DNAs in terms of, you know, are they going to be early adopters or are they going to w wait it out? And and I think that's basically what it is. And in fact, I would say, I could even say maybe I was a little too early to the game there because, you know, in 2015, uh, you know, when we when we launched the company. Uh, in fact, I, uh, the, the name is Stream Sets. I focused on the set-based transformations and, and the capabilities because people would say, oh, we don't need streaming. Well, a lot of them said, we will bring you on for streaming in addition to the incumbents um, that are in the space. So, so I think that's where we're at it. It's, you know, the, these things end up being kind of a, in my mind, a, you know, kind of a decade, multi-decade, uh, you know, kind of transformation, and so we're in the middle of that. You, you certainly were ahead of your time, 2015. <laughs> Uh, you have conceived of this concept of, uh, you're redefining iPass, really, in your yeah. super iPass concept. What is that, uh, how is your approach to integration different from everybody else's? Yeah, look, so I, I mentioned the, uh, the beginning that you know, we, we started off with this kind of cloud-native um, approach to, to data integration. Uh, you know, probably about three, four years ago, we started, uh, kind of made first contact with Software AG, uh, and of course, to certain folks, Software AG has got all sorts of uh, technologies like mainframe technologies and whatnot, um, but I actually was very aware of web methods as an app integration technology. I'd actually partnered with web methods at my previous job to try to marry this uh, idea of application integration and data integration into a single, single kind of combined, in this case, a multi-vendor, but a single offering. And we actually had been pretty successful with that in the, in the 2000s. Um, we called it a business activity platform uh, to kind of get these, get these two together. So three, four years ago, when I when I kind of reconnected with with Software AG, which had bought Web Methods, you know, um, 15 years back, I got really excited both about the the higher level idea of marrying you know stream sets with Web Methods, but equally importantly, the fact that Web Methods had made that shift to being cloud native and being kind of a, a software as service product too. I, I should say a hybrid because you know obviously we're not leaving anything behind. So there's a large uh, large install base that, that has web methods deployed on premise, but most of our new business now comes from um, the, the SaaS offering. And so the SaaS offering is aware of the on-premise offering and, and you know, works really well together. So when I learned this, or when I saw this, I got really excited. I thought that this is you know, one of those things that's been the holy grail. You know, the, the, I think the business problem exists. The technology maturity wasn't there to really kind of put these two together until everything got componentized and you know with no service so microservices and everything else and now i think the market maturity is starting to kind of you know emerge and it's going to take a little while because you know uh, i would give you know i give the example of just business productivity tools you know take like um, there was a time when i when i first learned how to use a spreadsheet and people would talk about powerpoint I'd be like, I don't know what that is, and I don't care, you know, because I was I was a quant guy, and I, all I, that's all I cared about. 
Uh, and then suddenly, you know, I, I couldn't buy Excel on its own. I had to buy, you know, Office or G Suite or, you know, whatever else. And, and, but along the way, I matured to realize that, oh, I can embed my Excel charts in my spreadsheets, you know, et cetera. So, so, so sorry, my Your Excel charts, <laughs> my, my PowerPoints. Um, and once you start getting that, you suddenly realize you're opening up a broader set of use cases. Sometimes it may be uh, I myself do, d does all the work, but in other situations, it may be a collaboration. Somebody creates me that spreadsheet, I embed it in my, my PowerPoint and I'm off and running, right? And I don't really care about all the gory details of that spreadsheet. That's the analogy, I think, um, that I would apply to the integration space, that there are components today, there's a lot of different uh, kind of personas that, that use these different components, but there is absolute business value in the long run for all of these things to be working together and ideally from a single vendor. Wonder, it's a wonderful uh, metaphor you, you use, and of course, cloud native uh, constructs make this easier That's for right. these components to be integrated together. Um, what about the role of AI? Your former employer, Informatica, is talking up a lot yeah. now about the value of AI and data integration. Uh, is that a game changer in data integration? Will your customers be able to use AI to make sense out of all this varying data yeah. in various formats and types? I definitely think it's a game changer. Um, I think it's a bit of a, a kind of quote unquote show me story. I mean, you could, I could have said the same thing about OpenAI 10, 15 years ago, or not, not, let's not say 15, let's say seven, eight years ago when they, when they were founded. And, and you, know, you would have to wait to see the end results before you actually said, okay, this is good enough and this is cool. I think the same thing is going to happen um, really in any, any vertical and definitely in the integration space, both data and app, app integration. Um, and the reason being that the amount of data uh, so, so let me break it down. So, gener generative AI gives you the conversational interfaces, great. But the domain specific information which you need, which is easily available for generic conversations, you know, the people are scouring the whole web, web for anything and everything there, but integration domain specific information is not out there. It's actually locked into these you know, products mm -hmm. and technologies that we have out here, right? So, so I think, he or she that figures that out, captures the most amount of integration data, and then does the right things with it, is going to you know win because they're going to show the, the value. Um, I'm going to be a bit of a contrarian. I don't like to knock, uh, definitely not my former employer, but, <laughs> uh, uh, but and it's not to say we're not doing this, but, but really we break down uh, the AI application into three different uh, buckets. The first is, um, the collaboration with the, with the lines of business. You know, the emergence of business technologists you know, that used to be called shadow IT, and shadow IT basically stayed away from IT. You know, that was what the, that was Now the, they're being integrated. Now they're integrated, and now they're calling now they're themselves the business technology, yeah. and enterprise guys are you know, embracing them, and they're embracing the enterprise, et cetera. So, so there's kind of, I think, an opportunity to bring AI into that to help with that collaboration. So that's one area. The second area, which is I think what everybody thinks about and assumes is making those engineers productive, more productive, right? So what if instead of writing all this code, you can just magically you know, say a few things and out pops enterprise grade um, artifacts, you know, data flows and data pipelines or application flows and data pipelines, et cetera. So that's the second bucket. And the third bucket is around uh, the operations. You know, what if you could very quickly understand when anomalous things are happening? what the root cause analysis of that is, and have that in this conversational interface to you know, get it out, right? So, so I think those are the three buckets, and I feel everybody tends to talk about this middle bucket a lot. Uh, and I frankly think that's the hardest, and you, I could even argue maybe it's the least valuable. Mm -hmm. I don't think we need to bring AI to get rid of one developer at this point in time. Maybe in the future we won't need any humans, but that's not where you want to optimize for right now and say we don't need developers, we can use AI. The, the other two areas are, I think, ripe, because it's a new way of kind of sharing information and thinking and developing things, uh, and you know, we'll either have to create a lot of tooling around it, or maybe AI can help. And the, the operations, I mean, we, I just came from our, our customer advisory board uh, talk, uh, not talk, um, meeting this morning, and resoundingly, everybody has his operations problem. You know, because you know, every time you do something complicated, you run it a hundred times, you run it a thousand times before you change that, that whatever you did in the first place. And that's where 
when things go wrong, you know, other, like I was going to give you other statistics, like, you know, eight out of 10 people say that this, this complex technology is make, it, make everything very brittle. We have an operations problem. And I think if we can bring AI to that, where we actually have a lot more data, you know, 10, 10 times as much runtime metadata as we have design time metadata. So if you can bring AI to that, I think you know, that could be a, a cool game changer, at least in our space, and I would argue in many other spaces. Uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention that things will be changing in the, within the next few months. Uh, web methods and uh, stream sets are going to be migrating to IBM. You will become part of IBM, as will many of your people. What are you telling your customers right now about what this change means? Yeah, so look, it's, it's, uh, it's not just a product technology transfer, it's an actual kind of full business unit uh, you know, transfer. So we have all the functions go to market, you know, sales, marketing, uh, customer support, customer success, engineering, product, you know, the whole, whole shebangs uh, kind of heading, heading over to IBM. So from our customer's perspective, you know, they, they know that the only things that they may have to deal with uh, differently, which they shouldn't have dealt at all, is some back office things. So, um, so I think that's, that's, um, that's like, let's call it, you know, the uh, assuaging their fears, so to speak. Uh, you know, so that's, that's a piece of it. Uh, but really, what I would say is that we're all very excited about this because, you know, even as I talk about data and app integration, there are other th things around, for example, um, event management, which we don't have, which IBM has. So I think actually that we can bring more components into this super iPaaS framework. Uh, and of course, IBM's got a very, very deep te technology stack in the data space. Uh, which we don't have, so there's almost no overlap between stream sets and what IBM has. So bringing all of those kind of capabilities, data observability, uh, data lineage, things that have existed forever, which we didn't focus on as a startup at stream sets, bring those and leveraging that, and of course, there's Watson X and, you know, and the AI platform there. So you put that all together, I think there's technology um, kind of synergies and, and excitement about what we can do together. There's excitement, I think, on their part because they've made a you know, big bet on this and we're actually going to be at scale and functioning you know, the way we've been functioning. It is not just a tuck-in type acquisition at IBM. Uh, so I think it can actually be transformational to the rest of the integration and automation stack at IBM. So, uh, so generally, you know, when I talk to our customers, they say, obviously change you know, always is uncomfortable and they can, you can always point to an acquisition by IBM that didn't go as well as uh, expected, but you know, in this particular case, you know, we should treat this as a, a specimen, a specimen of one, and um, you know, go at it. So that's that's what we're looking to do. And my colleague Dave, uh, Dave Vellante, the chief analyst at uh, at the Cube Research, very bullish on IBM right yeah. now. Says that company is is undergoing a trans transformation. Thinks Watson X looks like a fantastic uh, technology, and uh, something that uh, yeah, sounds it's, very it's, exciting. You know, being run by a product. Uh, leader for the first time in the history, I think, of the company. So it reminds me a lot of what happened at Microsoft about 10 years ago. So that's that's where I feel they're at right that now. That was exciting too. George yeah. Poncha, thank you very much for joining us, taking time out of your busy schedule at this busy conference. My pleasure. I'm Paul Gillen, this is theCUBE. We'll be right back. We're back from Dublin. Paul Gellin here for the Cube at the Software AG International User Groups Conference, winding up day two and just coming off an interesting presentation by Ronaldo Rubiero, who is the IT manager at Cinebra, about how they completed a transition to S4 HANA, SAP S4 HANA, during the pandemic uh, with the help of Aris for uh, scheduling a very complex project. Ronaldo, thank you so much for joining us. Okay, thank you so much for the invite to stay uh, with you today. It's my pleasure to stay here. Uh, tell us a little bit about Cinebra, what business you are in. Cinebra is a, a pulp mill in the South America. We are in Brazil, located in, in the South of Brazil. And uh, we produce um, pulp, uh, pulp craft from eucalyptus. We export our production, 100%, near 100% of our production through North America. Asia and Europe. We are the Japanese capital, and uh, we, we follow uh, every every regulation that have in is possible, is necessary, and we have a strong uh, management environment. We gain management 
because our sustainability depends on this. Sustainability is an important part of your yes, charter. Yes, important part. Uh, how, how large a, an estate uh, of forests do you, do you have? We have two, 55, 254, uh, thousand hectares of forests in Minas Gerais. 254,000 yes. hectares. Yes, 42%, 41%, 42% of this, uh, this lands is uh, for the uh, natural, for the native species. Only 54% of this is to planted forests. Uh, by eucalypto, on eucalypto. And it's a commitment to sustainability. Yes, yes. So you have been uh, using SAP for a long time. For a long time. You realized a few years ago that you had to make a transition. Why, why, the, why did you want to make the transition when you, when you chose to make it? Yes, we have been using SAP uh, since 2002. So during this time, just 20 years, and uh, we have been doing the upgrades, but uh, there's one time that, that was impossible to do the upgrade anymore because uh, our hardware was uh, losing warranty and uh, uh, the other situation uh, forced us to change our version. So we have been studying a uh, new version for a long time and we decided with the directors to approve the investment to do the change. Uh, from SC, uh, ECC to S400. This was a huge decision. It's not a, a, a cheap project. Yeah. It's involved most of uh, uh, people from the, the, the corporation. It's very important. So it was necessary to do a, a, a huge schedule and a huge planning. And we did this to have uh, to increase our uh, automatization of our process and uh, to improve the, 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 the velocity of our uh, processing. It was uh, losing some uh, time during the, the financial the, uh, in the, the end of each month. So it was a, a, a very uh, important project for Sendibra. So you got the approval to go ahead in 2019. You began the migration in 2020. We all know what happened then. How did the arrival of the pandemic affect your plans? Oh my God, it's, it's a huge problem to us. We never been managing projects before uh, remotely. So when we uh, start the project, the pandemic starts together. So we have a, a, a difficult decision to continue with the person, we stop the project. So, Seniba uh, decided with the directors to continue the project. It's, it was our first project that we did uh, completely remotely. It was, uh, this project was a 13 month play month. We stayed during uh, the completely 13 months remotely. So, um, so you completed the entire project remotely. The entire project. The That's remotely. remarkable. Yes, I, I, I never been, I never stay with the manager from the partner that uh, we contract to help us. I never stay together. So you weren't able yes. to meet. Yes, we partner. never have one meet presentially. And can you in person? Can you say how many people were involved in this migration? One hundred seventy-eight people. 178 people. Uh, yes, it's inter interesting because uh, we built a new uh, building so everybody goes to the earth before the pandemic. The pandemic came. We get uh, this, this, uh, this building for, we transfer this for other area to use for others, other situations in Sevilla. And we learn how to manage the project remotely. It was the first project of SAP that uh, uh, from uh, the migration for S for S four hundred did completely remotely. The first project in the world. So you you were making this up, and SAP is making it up yes, as you go yes. along. Uh, how did Eris uh, enter into your your cycle? Yes, every area was involved on this project. 
uh, it's amount of, of people, in, uh, a huge amount of people there. And uh, there's one uh, part of people from the, the partnership, the partner that we, 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 we hire. And there's amount of people, it was uh, from Zenibra for the IT team. There's a amount of people that was the key users from the area. They are uh, get from the area and goes to your house and they stay completely dedicated on for the project during this or 13 months. We hire people to uh, supply the areas during this project. Yeah, what things was not focusing on? And I understand, I saw your presentation, a remarkable amount of testing was required. Uh, thousands of tests were, were involved. Yes. Why was the testing load so, so large? Yes, uh, SAP in Sinidra is a uh, whole process. Even forest, uh, back office, maintenance, operational, our commercial area, Everything inside every part of your every operation. part inside the SAP. So, when I we do the synchronization between uh, Aris tools with the solution manager, Aris tools from Software Eng, solution manager from SAP, when we do this, uh, each task was generated and goes through the case of tests. So, um, it's a uh, to do it manually. It's almost impossible to have um, certainly of everything. When you get this automatically, they list two, in, in case of Cinebra on this project, it was uh, 12,200 days of tests. 12,200 tests. Yes. D different tests. Different tests. By these 178 people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With, uh, in fact, the people that was tested on this, only the, the, the operational area, right. it was 78. Right. Only 70. The others is all automation, it's uh, 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 the, the partner and uh, the IT team, the others one. Still a, a phenomenally complex process. So how were you able to uh, to, uh, to core or, or to orchestrate the test so that you knew a test had been completed, you knew it was successful, or you knew that there were, was a problem with it. Uh, how was this all orchestrated? It's very important, the figure of the PMO at that moment. Yeah. If you don't have a good PMO, it's impossible to claim. So uh, the PMO helped us a lot to do this. And during the project, we changed are a way to manage the project oh, really? from yeah. waterfall to quick tests. So agile methodology. So you so, went to agile while you were doing. Yes, doing we changed the during the project because uh, because it wasn't complex. Yeah, enough, yes, yes, it's, uh, it's 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 everything new for us. Yeah. During the project, we decided to do the agile testing, the agile uh, and change to waterfall to the agile sure. during the project. Well, if you're changing one thing, you might as well change more. <laughs> okay. so, so the project was completed in 13 months, which is which is remarkable yes, yes, under 13. the circumstances. What has been the impact of that move to S4 HANA on your business? Oh yes, uh, it's a good uh, a good question because uh, when I go to the, my my CEO to ask him about the budget, to explain about the budget, they ask me how. Uh, benefits you will give to, be, to the business. In uh, exactly moment, it's not a, a, a good benefit. But after this, nowadays, we, are, we have been doing some automatization of our process. Nowadays, we have probability, possibility to do the, uh, the applying AI in our process. In the past, it was very, very difficult. And uh, other thing uh, is the the time of uh, to run and the machine. So uh, our process was uh, completely delayed each time by time, each month by month. So we have the risks in the past, and the, the, our system stopped. So we renew the machines, we need renew the with servidors. So everything is okay just now, and uh, some tasks. Uh, in the past was um, run 
in the long time. Uh, so you know, this is uh, everything is normal. It's uh, important to to have uh, um, less risk compared to the past. The other important thing, we have two companies in Brazil, in uh, near Senibra, Senibra and Senibra Log, logistic company. One company has SAP, the other one has another ERP. So during this, during this migration, we do the, uh, we have been using the same system. Now, every, every, um, every manager of these two companies in the same system, and now it's in SAP. So your logistics company and your forest yes. product company are now yes. are now in the same system. And you mentioned AI. What are you doing with AI? How how is that benefiting your business? Yes, uh, we 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 are building the the correct way for the AI, right. and uh, we have initiatives of AI already, and uh, with uh, lots of benefits. We can uh, we can discuss about. We have. Um, Forests, and we monitor our forests with CFTV, with uh, images, mm -hmm. and uh, when we have some uh, fire, oh, the smoke, the AI can identify in the beginning of the, the fire. Oh, it's fantastic! It can suggest to us to uh, to go there uh, quickly, to the team of the firemen to go there quickly. So it's one case. But we have a lots of cases, for example, uh, to read the reports from the maintenance team, to do the resume of these reports, and to generate the maintenance maintenance order, to uh, and send to the, the right uh, team to do the maintenance. You can so you can gather all the maintenance yes, data yes. and generate a, a manifest of schedule for your perfectly, maintenance team. Perfectly, perfectly. So it's a two of, of case that we have, we have a lots of case, but nowadays we have been working uh, together to list the main suggestion of uh, AI cases. And uh, for the next year, we will plan uh, to install the more priority case for the company. So we, we, we already have three important meetings with the areas. They will suggest the process that need to uh, to have. We we will put it in the spreadsheet, and we will classify this what is most important at the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will decide to use case by case. We will go to the market, of course, to help us to build AI for uh, to increase and uh, to re uh, to increase our efficiency, reduce costs of uh, of course, and to improve our corporation day by day. And uh, it's an important case for me, for the, uh, the Celebra. It's uh, our goal for the next year, for this year, for the next year. And the president of the company wait a lot with this case of AI helping out the, the process. Uh, how important was the S4 HANA to laying the foundation for yes, your AI? Yes, it's a good question. Uh, the importance well, is of the, the facility to exchange data with the other system. It's the main point that I'd like to, mm -hmm. to comment. Because in your old ECC system, said data was locked it's up. It's quite very difficult. difficult to, to migrate. There's a way to, to exchange data, but it's quite difficult. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, foundation, hope you've laid foundation for a new company. The pandemic now has passed and. <laughs> And you're able to, uh, to to maybe laugh about the situation, but yes, it certainly was a remarkable story you told today. And uh, congratulations! And uh, thank you so much. Much luck to you, Ronaldo Ribeiro, IT manager at Cinebro. Thanks so much for joining us here on the Cube today. Thank you so much. I'm we'll be back from Dublin. After the party. Welcome back to Software AG's 2024 International Users Groups Conference. Users Groups, plural, uh, here in Dublin. Uh, we're talking with right now with uh, Joseph Blando. Did I get that right? It was perfect. Thank you. Who nice is, to see you. Nice to see you too. Head of Eris uh, Product Marketing. Eris, of course, the product, the pro uh, process mining and process modeling product that is really kind of the flagship of the Software AG portfolio right now. You've been with uh, with Eris for a long time, 
Uh, Eris was the star of the show at yesterday's keynote where we saw the new generative AI capabilities being applied first to process mining, later to process modeling, and uh, a lot of excitement in the audience about these features. How are you going to take this to the market? Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. So we have a lot of uh, activities planned already for the go-to-market of this Gen AI functionality. So it's called the Aris AI Companion. And we started yesterday, as you just mentioned. So starting yesterday to communicate these um, new capabilities to our customer, to the people that know Aris already, then we'll get direct benefit of that. That's the first stage. Today we had a press release uh, to announce that to the broader market and to the press. And I think in a few minutes, I will have the first social media post coming out. So there's a big campaign planned around that to communicate that. And of course, we will reuse the usual marketing channels that we will have, that we have anyhow. So it's about webinars. It's about some short snippets, short video to explain how it works. It's about um, creating some papers to explain the usage of AI in Aris and how to do it right. And it's probably a lot or so about talking to our customers in dedicated user group because this one is the international user group but we have many other ones around the world and that's really key that we talk to our customers there and we are basically yeah Aris, we have newsletter and we will leverage this content for our sales people for our um service people and our partners so they can go out and talk to the people and show the benefit of um, the gen ai capabilities of rs so you have all the all the basics covered i do want to ask though one of the capabilities of these new generative ai cap uh, features is that software ag sees this as expanding the audience for errors the more people in the organization will now be able to participate in the process mining process modeling. Um, how does that change the way you market? Uh, is this a broader audience for you? Mm. No, that was, it's not a broader, no, it's not really a broader audience because the point with Aris, with process modeling and process mining is it has been seen as an expert topic in the past years. So you would have people model the processes. So these were the experts, but there was always a point where uh, you had a broader audience because you needed to communicate these processes. When you think about processes, it's not only about defining the way you work, it's about executing the way you work. And this is basically everyone in the organization. So we have really big customers Everyone is using Iris in the organization, but for informational purposes. So for more training, you know, when you come into the company, you're new, you get a process and you get to learn how you do your job. That's one thing. And the only difference, so I would say the target group extends a little bit, but it's more like, what does the target group, what do these people in the company do with Iris? So they use Aris already, but now they are more empowered because they can on their own ask questions yeah. to the systems, try to optimize the, the system, what they did maybe more manually or based on collaboration. Mm -hmm. So I would say same people, just a different um, capability. What do businesses don't not know about their processes? I think they don't know what they don't know. <laughs> so if they are... Yeah, if, if they are not looking at the business processes, if they are not looking at the operations, they don't get the visibility they need into the processes, into the organization. So they don't get the visibility where to optimize. So they don't understand where can we shorten a process? Where do we have a lot of process variations? So you define a standard, you have a standard, and then maybe you find out, oh, in France, they do it completely differently. And if they don't, analyze that with process management and process management, then they don't know that they should improve and they, they that they lose time in some process areas, for example. Uh, talk about the evolution of process mining. You've been, uh, your, your first involvement with Eris was 24 years ago, and a lot has changed in that time. Uh, contrast the way businesses would model processes at the turn of the last century and the way they do it now with technology. You make me feel old, but still I answer your question. I promise you I'm older. <laughs> that may be. Um, uh, this is really exciting because uh, I started as an SAP consultant, so I was not always the Aris uh, lady. And at the time, 
We were, of course, looking at the operations of the company. Of course, the, com the companies wanted to get the visibility and understand how they're going to work. But how we did that was really different. So because it was more manual, of course, we had Aris, so we added software to model the processes, no problem. But we did it all manually. So in the end, a project, an optimization project in a company would look like this. You were traveling three months around the world. You will be visiting each and every department, each and every um, location in the, this company, and you were discussing with people. So you had a lot of workshops asking the people, well, how do you do your job? So if you want to create a customer order, how do you do that? And you would model. So, okay, the first step is this one. The second step is this one. When you finish, ah, you talk to this department, ah, and then you put that into that IT system and so forth. At the end, you will review that with the people and there will be a point of time, quite long time after, where we, you would roughly know how the organization is working. You even haven't started to optimize anything. Now, with process mining, with uh, RPA, with AI, you can get some kind of a starting point. You get the 80% solution, I would say, in days, or hours because and so you, much is automated already it's all, yeah, exactly and it's all it. automated already so you take process mining you plug it into the IT system and you get already 80% of the process how it is running and then you just refine that but you have a base so you're much faster and then we, when you start looking at this process how it works right now and you want to optimize that you don't even need to to look at the process you ask AI so where can I optimize? Where do I have process bottlenecks? Where do I have um, system breaks? And you get already a starting point to improve your processes, your operation. So that leads you to success much faster. And the second point is, so you start faster, but you can also improve faster because you have some kind of a continuous loop where you can even check okay you set up a process you optimize this process people know about the process they execute the process and then you have an automatic control compliance checking for example that gives you insights aha you know what these and these and these people are doing it a different way or maybe in france it's running differently so you start again you inform the people you do new trainings so you can optimize the process faster so what customers tell you they they bring in aris they go through all the exercises, they spend a year working on process uh, process uh, improvement. What do they tell you about what they learn in that process? I think uh, they, are, they learn a lot of things, that's for sure. They learn how to transform. I would say they learn two big things. They learn how to test and fail. Yeah. And um, they learn a lot about communication and change management because processes, process management, process mining, it is, of course, it is technology, but in the end, the process is in many cases people business. So you have to communicate with the people, you have to take the people with you, you have to, to manage the change in the organization so that people execute the processes the right way. Whatever system you have in the back, so change management is a key topic. That's one thing. And the second thing is, um, I said, learn to fail. And I'm not kidding. Uh, and fail fast. So you put a new process in place, you analyze, you do your very best, but there will be some pitfalls. So you need to really look at this process very often to improve that again and again and again. So when I say fail, it's not a big fail, but it's like, okay, the process is not running exactly the right way. This way, we're gonna change that, roll that out again, inform the people again, so that we are improving continuously. So I would say these two topics are really uh, key to process management. These are very soft topics, so not software related, but they are really key. And um, adding a third one, um, well, they really learn that uh, processes are at the center of their operations in the end, and that this is key to their success. Ultimately, process improvement comes down to people. It comes down to people being willing to change the way they do things, exactly. which can uh, challenge uh, power, uh, silos, fiefdoms. Yes. How do organizations prepare culturally for starting the process improvement process. I'm sorry I didn't get that. Can you repeat that because of the background noise? How do how do organizations prepare culturally for process improvement? 
Yeah, it really depends on the organization size. That's one thing. Uh, but in normally they kind of set up some um, center of excellence. So they have groups of people that will be working on the processes. So they have kind of a central team that is managing this project, that is communicating around the pro project, setting deadlines. But very much important, they are having people into the different departments, into the different, hopefully not silos, but areas, which will represent processes, which will be responsible for the processes in that specific department. And it can mean only communicating with the colleagues. Oh, look, you can use Iris there, and there you can get your information. And you know what, we're working on new processes and we're gonna execute that in SAP or whatever. It can be only communicating, but it can be also a role of a person that really manage that the processes are always up to date, that they are um, communicated and that people work the right way. So uh, also there you have some central expert people, but you have all this crowd of people that you need to manage it for that. You need people in each and every area of the company. So you need champions really around the company. Exactly. How do you find champions. organizations that's, that are successful with process modeling, how do you find their culture changes? How do they change? You mean after they, they have started? After they have successfully remodeled their processes and gone through the cultural change that's necessary, how are those companies different? They succeed? <laughs> no, really, I'm not kidding, because processes is really at the heart of the organization. So it's kind of the DNA of the organization. So in the end, a company that looks at the processes that looks at the operation we will gain some kind of a learning success structure uh, culture and people will will start talking about the way they're working so they will not start say uh, will they will stop saying we've always done that way no they will change this mindset and they will start thinking about okay how can we improve and what is the next big thing that we can improve on and you know what we heard from customers that this and that is not working and instead of looking maybe for a small solution in an IT system, they will think about the whole process, the whole customer journey. So it's really about learning learning to learn, create a culture of optimization and a culture of overall thinking and not thinking only in the specific silo you're working in. One initiative that most organizations have now, large organizations have now, revolves around sustainability corporate social responsibility. You are a certified sustainability manager from Cambridge University. What what changes does sustainability, the sustainability initiatives cause in enterprise processes? Well, it causes a lot. That's a, that's a very nice question. Thanks for that. Um, often organizations don't see that, but sustainability projects, sustainability initiative, or sustainability strategy and sustainability success in an organization is all linked to the processes. Because it's not enough to have the board say, oh, we are going to reduce our carbon footprint by 20%. So what? You, you need the people, yeah, yeah. you have to make that happen. And that's exactly the point. And with processes, with process management, you can change that because you can define your strategy, but then you can go the next steps and look at the processes where you have the most emissions, let's say, and improve these processes. So look at where you create a lot of carbon emissions or you use too much water or paper, whatever. So, and you can improve these processes. You can communicate these processes. It's always the same story, just a different topic. You communicate the processes, you execute on these processes. People are working a different way. And at the end, you can then measure, aha, uh -huh. so we did that. We improved our uh, carbon emission by 20%, let's say. And then with that, we reached our goal. So. Um, looking at sustainability in the operations is making it tangible. So it's not a big strategic plan where you say, we're going to plan that. No, you just do that. And then in the end, you are able to prove that. And not only from a, an accounting perspective, like KPIs, carbon reductions, whatever. It's also you can prove that you are compliant for all the regulations that we see around. So the company at the end can say, okay, we did change our processes. We had this goal and we are complying to this ESG rule, whatever they call it in the different countries. So you can really prove at the end and make sure people work the right way. Yeah. The final question, uh, executive watching this video right now, 
who doesn't think about process mining, who's never considered overhauling processes, what message would you have for that person? Mm, measure first. <laughs> yeah, I would tell them measure first. So before you take a decision, before you change the strategic um, direction of the company, measure how the processes are running. So not only measure the financial KPIs, they do that anyhow, but measure how you are working, look at the optimization potential that you have in your operations. And in many cases, it's huge gains of efficiency. It's huge gains of money, of time, and it increases uh, your customer satisfaction in the end. So it's all in your processes. Joseph Blandu. Product, head of Ares Product Marketing, you are a delight to talk to. Your energy is uh, is uh, catching. And thank you very much for joining us here on theCUBE. Thanks for having me, and have a great time here at IUG. We'll be back from Dublin. Thank you. Thank you.